So we've talked about using the simple cortical model to understand speech processing. But to try to gain a better understanding of syntax, we need to move on from that simple model and consider a somewhat com more complex cortical view. And we'll start with the problem I mentioned earlier. In the simple cortical model we were using, how could a brain discriminate between a rabbit chasing a giraffe and a giraffe chasing a rabbit? The problem occurred using this simple model. So we'll introduce a slightly more complex cortical model. And the key difference is that there are receptive fields on a number of extra levels of complexity. For example, between the levels that in the past I've labeled discriminates visual objects and discriminates groups of objects in the simple model, I've inserted a couple of extra levels. And to make explanation easier, I've labeled these extra levels discriminates qualified objects and discriminates object relationships. The discriminates qualified objects level can discriminate between, for example, a large dog and a small dog. The discriminates object relationships level can discriminate between, for example, a dog chasing and a dog being chased. In other words, the additional levels add a bit more information to their receptive field definitions to make finer discriminations possible. But remember that, as always, all the different levels are simply receptive fields defined on different levels of complexity, where complexity is defined by the number of raw sensory inputs that ultimately contribute to the receptive field definitions. The process of evolution has resulted in these levels of complexity. But the process of evolution doesn't know about visual object categories and so on. Natural selection pressures simply select for ranges of receptive field complexities that are particularly effective for discriminating between circumstances that have important behavioural implications. But the labels are useful for talking about the approximate types of circumstances that are particularly well discriminated by receptive field complexities at a given level. But essentially, these areas are just adding receptive fields at intermediate levels of complexity. Now, to understand this model, let's first think about how an actual visual scene would be processed. In this scene, an adult man has a very large dog on the lead. So, how will the visual inputs be processed through the cortical areas? The area illustrated at the top detects receptive fields correlating with boundaries on the retina, as we discussed earlier in the course. These detections recommend more detailed processing of the visual inputs within the boundary, among other recommendations and possible functional roles. So, if the dog image on the retina is selected, receptive fields will be strongly detected in the top three layers. The activity at the discriminates objects level is prolonged and limited information derived from the boundary around another object is selected for further processing, generating some additional receptive field detections. I'm illustrating these additional fields in the same sequence of areas, but an alternative could be that if we identify the discriminates objects area as TE in the cortex, they could reach TE from the area LIP that detects just more general shapes. Both populations in the discriminates objects area are prolonged, and limited information derived from the shape of the lead is selected for processing. That generates a few more receptive field detections, and the receptive field detection outputs at the discriminates objects level derived from the dog, the shape of the man, and the shape of the lead are brought into the same modulation phase, effectively releasing them to the discriminates qualified objects level. That drives receptive field detections at that level. These receptive fields contain information derived from the dog and also limited information about the man and the lead, such as relative size and position on the retina. 
Hence, these detections correlate, for example, with the presence of a large dog. A similar sequence of processing, starting with full information derived from the lead, generates activity at the qualified objects level corresponding with the presence of a heavy lead. The outputs from these two populations are synchronized and released to the object, object relationships level. And they'll drive activation of a column population that correlates with the presence of something leading a dog. Repeating the sequence of attention and information release processes, but for the man and the lead combination, leads to a population in the object relationships level correlating with a man leading something. These two populations are synchronized and released to the group of objects level, where they drive a population that correlates with a man leading a dog. Quite different populations will be activated at these levels by a picture of a dog leading a man, and these populations will be able to discriminate consistently between the two types of situation. On the auditory side, close to inputs, the receptive fields are able to discriminate between the momentary presence of different sound frequencies or silences. The next level, receptive fields are combinations of top-level receptive fields and can discriminate between different phonemes or pauses in the flow of speech. As we'll discuss in a minute, some of those receptive fields have recommendation strengths in favour of synchronisation and release of visual array outputs between various levels at appropriate moments, as we've been describing. More complex receptive fields discriminate between words and have recommendation strengths in favour of indirect activation of visual columns in various levels. And receptive fields at the groups of words level are defined by combinations of receptor fields at the words level and may also recommend synchronization and release of visual array outputs at various levels. And of course there are the receptor fields defined by groups of auditory or visual columns that are often active at the same time. But again we'll simplify the discussion by leaving out the role of those uh, uh, in the, uh, indirect activation columns. So Having discussed how regular visual experience is handled within this uh, more complex architecture, in the next section we'll have a look at how speech uh, is actually handled and how it can generate uh, the appropriate uh, pseudo-visual experiences.